Tonight's DJ and TV show is sponsored in part by Electro Voice, DJ Event Planner, ADJ, NLFX Professional, Promo Only, Newmark, and DJ and TV Insiders. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this episode of Drax Bites. I'm Drax. I'll be your host. Today, we're going to talk about fetishes and fantasies. These are things DJs cling to for life. One fetish is believing that they can charge whatever they want. It's kind of a fetish and a fantasy. It's a fetish because people trot around telling people, raise your price, charge whatever, do whatever, all in the absence of facts, all in the absence of a business plan. Folks, if somebody tells you that you're worth more and you should just double your price, ignore them because they don't have any facts to back it up. Now, if that's some, somebody is somebody that knows you well, you network with, they've seen you in action, they know what your, your photo booth and, or your DJ service is like, listen to them. They have some predicate to teach you this. But if somebody just out of the blue on Facebook tells you you need to double your price, ignore them. Now, I don't mean ignore them completely, but ignore them in the fact of don't go out and double your price. Instead, use that as a motivation to go in and examine your price, examine what you're doing, examine the kind of structure you have, examine your opportunities, look at how many events you have booked, how many you don't, how many leads you get for any particular event. That tells you the predicate of if you can raise your price. For example, if you get six leads for any given Saturday for a photo booth or a DJ, then you can definitely raise your price. Why? Because you've got enough other swings at the bat to work that week at your full price if you fail. Why not? Do it. If somebody contacts you for a date that's two years in the future, why not quote them a higher price? Because you've got two years to recover that date if you lose that lead. See, the key, folks, to raising your price is about demand and about value and about what the market will provide to you. The market will provide to you anything you ask if you provide the value to the per person wishing to purchase. Everybody shops on value because the axiom holds true in the absence of value, everybody shops on price, everyone. So as you think about these concepts, think about how you have your business. Is your business structured to be sold on price because your value is that it's really, really low and therefore it's a high uh, value return for the customer? That's one business model. However, another business model is my price is here, my value is here, but my demand for that is here. You see what we're doing here? The demand for that creates the demand of value. Even though someone feels they got what they paid for, I could elevate that price and inch it up because the demand is way up here. Those are things you need to think about. Raising your price needs to be a function of demand and the value that your current customers receive. If everybody feels that they got exactly what they paid for, you need to improve your service. Take training, learn better photo skills, whatever it is with your, the event business that you do, be it DJ, photo booth, you've got to elevate the value you provide to the customer in advance. Then it's worth more. When it's worth substantially more, then it justifies a higher price. These are the things that all real businesses do. Every business does. There's no magic because you're a DJ. You're not some magically entitled person. You're not Tom Cruise. You're a photo booth. You're not a photographer. You're not doing portraiture. You don't have a catalog that says 
I've been the photo booth at the White House inauguration dinners for the last 10 years. If you do, then you should obviously be at your top of your market. If you can show a high demand and high quality service, that justifies a price. So don't fall into the fetish and fantasy that price is some sort of arbitrary thing. It's not. People will talk to you about inelasticity of price. Price is very elastic. If you're in a market and all of a sudden, here's an example. I grew up in a town that was largely a railroad town. Railroad employed probably 45% of the people in the town, either directly employed by the railroad or in ancillary services used by the railroad. Well, the city, for example, wanted a stretch of city, uh, the railroad wanted the city to give them a stretch of city park out south of town. A part of the park no one ever used. The city rejected their request, to which the railroad left town. They moved. Now, they didn't sell the real estate they owned, this huge track and switch yard that ran right through the middle of town. They kept that. So now, instead of a thriving railway, rail center, there's a big, blighted, empty pile of dirt because the city was too dumb. So what do you think happened to the, elastic, the non-elasticity of their price or inelasticity? It blew up. And here's why. Because the railroad wanted something. The city failed to see the value of giving them that 100 yards of park would be to the city an expanded business, expanded employment base, and expanded ancillary businesses supporting the railroad. So the town's price for doing business in the town was blown apart. Unemployment became huge. Many people had to leave town. The economy tanked. Do you think their desire to keep their price just went on like it did? No. They had to change their price. And the same is true with you. If people were in that market that did DJ and photo booth, and there used to be 5,000 events a year, and now there's only 1,000, well, guess what? There's less events. That means more competition. That means pricing will become more challenged because again, you have to have the value proposition and while you can keep your price and your value and you can keep that relationship, the issue that you now have is you now have 20 or 80% less market opportunity to work with. So you may find that your price will have to move or you'll simply work less. And working less is never a good situation. Despite what people say, it's never a good situation. You want to be working as often as you can for as much as you can. You hear what I said there now? As often as you can for as much as you can. You see, because that's what business is. Business isn't being a boutique DJ and working three times a year for $5,000. Being a business is making enough money that you earn a living. Same for a photo booth. It's making enough money that it becomes a living. So as you think about this fetish and fantasy of price, you now see that pricing is fixed by solid math, a business plan. Knowing your cost, what your cost of service is, what you need to earn to provide that photo booth or provide that DJ service, and that helps establish the price. Knowing the total number of potential events, that also helps establish the price. Because guess what, folks? You're never going to have 80% market share. Never. Just never going to happen. Nobody has 80% market share. You can find almost no brand that holds 80% market share in a segment where there is competition. Now, here's another fetish and fantasy that you can define your market. It's both true and it's both false. You can't define your market 
until you're in your market. And that means you need to be in the market, working, growing your business. You see, because defining your market becomes a function of creating demand. Demand defines your market. Until you create demand, you have no market to define. And what that means is take a look in the consumer segment to FedEx. FedEx was in the business of transferring merchandise from one point to another. Before the people that founded FedEx, they were in other aspects of the transportation business. They came to the market with the idea of, let's see, I can put something across the country the next day. They innovated something completely unique, something that did not exist in the package or information or material transfer uh, industries. If you wanted to ship something, it was going to be four to five to six days minimum to go from the East Coast to the West Coast. FedEx defined a market because they came from being within the transportation market. They formed and made a company based on an idea that they thought there was an opportunity that would succeed. And the next thing you know, everything just absolutely ha positively has to be there overnight, didn't it? All of a sudden, FedEx became a household word. I'll FedEx that to you. I'll send it to you via FedEx. And they built a huge business because they saw an opportunity, but they could define the market because they knew and understood the market. FedEx wasn't started by just a couple random capitalists that decided to buy a bunch of airplanes and employ a lot of folks. They had market data, market research, and they understood the goods and services delivery market better than anyone else in it. Better than anyone else in it. Now, here's an example of an epic fail. See, because I had a business and I used FedEx all the time because I shipped sensitive equipment. And all of a sudden, UPS started offering next day shipments, and that was great. But U UPS still largely treated them like freight. Well, UPS got into the freight business, the big box business heavy box business. Well, FedEx decided to get into the big box freight business. They sucked at it. They were horrible. Why? Because they moved from their lane. They moved from what they were great at to try to be something else. And they didn't do it by starting an enterprise. They bought a freight company that was poorly managed and going broke. And that should have like been the first clue. You're buying a company that's doing poorly in his crap, they're not going to be a good choice. But I digress. The lesson learned is even the best companies can make stupid decisions because they get greedy. They get looking for a bigger piece of the pie. They want to expand. And when you do that in your photo booth or your DJ business, you're doomed. You're doomed. You want to be in the lane that you know and know well and have defined. And the reason I say that is because you've defined it because you were in the photo booth or the DJ business and you were serving a large broad spectrum of clients and you started to hone in on the types of events you like to do, the types of clients you like to work with. And what you did is you developed something that became valuable to them, to that group of clients. That allowed you to hone in your market, to define it. That's how you do that, folks. Now, another fetish and fantasy that exists out there comes about in believing that you have to buy expensive equipment. I covered a bit of this last week. Folks, you don't. Don't buy garbage equipment. Buy high quality equipment used versus buying crappy equipment new. Because in the end, crap equipment is still crap equipment. And great equipment is still great equipment, regardless if it's a couple years old. I have a DDJ SX from Pioneer. Still in my, in my equipment as a DJ, even though I use the state-of-the-art emulator Elite. Why is that Pioneer DDJ there? Because I know it is durable, reliable, and rock solid. It just works. 
It's my backup piece should I ever need something or need a ceremony system. So the concept is don't get sucked into the fetish of having new gear. Because, yeah, you want to go on Facebook and brag about it, but it doesn't work that way. Another thing you'll hear people talk about on Facebook is contracts. Let's jump into this new fetish and fantasy. The fetish DJs have is on words. They think they can use the word retainer, and that magically makes whatever money they collect or charge the client immutable, that it's theirs. They can keep it forever because they used the magic word. Folks, there is no magic words. There's nothing you can put in your contract that immutably makes it ironclad and immutable. It doesn't. Because in the end of the day, you haven't given the customer anything. That's called value, earned money. There's a magic word, earned money. You want to keep your retainer? Earn the money. Earn the money. What you do with that is, for example, if you're a photo booth, you send them out bunches of template samples. You send them out materials about how you think the booth will look at their event, sketches, ideas, things you come up with. If you're on the DJ side, you're going to send them planners. You're going to send them uh, song selections. You're going to send them different aspects. You're going to send them material that is proprietary to your company that is value transferred. That allows that money to become earned money. Now, one of the big fallacies out there is dates are inventory. It's kind of true, but it's kind of false. Dates are inventory, but dates only become inventory when the window is narrow. For example, if someone books you two years in advance and cancels a year in advance, that date's not inventory because it can easily go back on the shelf. It's not lost inventory. It's not spoiled. And therefore, you cannot keep $200 and pass go. You have to refund their money unless you've earned it by giving them value. Giving them value is important. Now, yes, you can look at your retainer and the money they pay you as earned in consideration for removing that date from your calendar. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But you want to think about how you earn money. A contract is nothing more than a simple written agreement between two parties. If your contract is overly filled with legal language and terms and conditions, you're going to have a problem in court because the judge is going to look at that you had a fancy schmancy lawyer write a really tight one-sided contract and they'll toss it. And the reason they'll toss it is because it will have utilized language and mechanisms to ensnare the consumer with terms and things they didn't completely understand. The solidest, best, most defendable contract is the one that is equal and balanced to both sides of the party. They have escape clauses, you have escape clauses. You have expectations, they have expectations. Do you see what I'm trying to get here? Writing your contract to service only you is bad because when it only services you, you will most likely lose. Your contract needs to be fair and balanced. And what that means is, is there's as many protections for the client as there are for you. The other aspect as you, you think about this, as we talked about earned money, you have to be able to show that you've earned money. When you go to court, you need to be able to tell people, the judge most specifically, look, they hired me, they booked this date, and I earned that money because I gave them all this material, all of this value, and this is important. This is so important of why you keep good records. Once you sign a contract for a date, you immediately want to keep every single record of every person that ever calls you for that date, both before and after, because that's going to become the basis of your defense of money. How does it become the defense? If, let's say you have a contract, you're paid money, and you get 30 more calls between the date they signed the contract and when they decided to cancel the contract. If you go back and contact those 30 people that contacted you 
trying to regain their business and you have records of those emails, those phone calls, when you go to court, you can submit to the court, Your Honor, I did everything I could to find other work for that date. Not only do I get to keep the deposit because that's earned money because of the value of things provided and because I removed that date from my calendar and I have lost opportunity now, now they owe you the balance because they have a contract to owe, provide you the balance and you can show that I did everything in my power to mitigate the client's damages. Going to court with an evidentiary fact book of everybody you called, every opportunity you turned away between when they contracted and when they uh, broke the contract helps buttress your claim for losses. Because now if it's say 30 days out from the event, you might not rebook that. But you can even say, look, I even solicited work for 20% less or 30% less as a mechanism to work that night in an effort to mitigate their damages, knowing that I would have their deposit. And you can show the court, look, I looked to book something for uh, a fee minus that deposit as a way to mitigate their damages. If you book the event fully, you might find in court they would actually ask you to refund that retainer slash deposit, whatever. So are you getting a, a flavor of what we're talking about here? You must, 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 must do what you can to mitigate the client's damages that cancels. If you don't, you are on shaky ground, pure and simple, because a teary-eyed young woman is going to sway a lot of judges. The answer, though, to winning and prevailing is having all your facts, having data, understanding contracts, presenting the judge with the contract they signed, which was both fair and balanced to both parties, and the evidentiary data to support that immediately upon contracting you to, or contacting you to cancel, you went back and contacted everybody that had contacted you for that date prior that you declined. You see the value in good notes and good records? This is why you want a contact relation management tool. It's not just to keep track of the people that book you, it's to keep track of everybody that's contacted you. You want to use every lead list possible because when you go to court and you can say, Your Honor, I spent considerable time seeking to rebook that date. I contacted these 30 other people that contacted me. Unfortunately, they'd already hired someone else. When you do that, you now have a preponderance of evidence that leans to your favor to say, I'm not trying to damage the client. I'm not trying to damage them. I did everything I could to mitigate their damage, to relieve them from that obligation. Where do you think the judge is going to decide? He's going to decide on your behalf. Why? Because you acted in good faith and made a fair and balanced contract with the client, with the person that is breaking the, the contract and taking you to court. You acted in good faith through that period. You gave them value, templates for photo booths, suggestions, ideas, planners on the DJ and event side. You gave them value, things that were proprietary company property. So that becomes a representation of earning it. You didn't just book the date and didn't do anything. You now have something to say, I earned that. I gave them value. They gave me money. I gave them a planner. They gave me money. I gave them a collection of photo booth templates to choose from. You know, now they could go and use those templates with some other photo booth operator if they chose. That's a pr presumption, but you see what we're, you're doing here? You're painting a picture for the court to show that you've acted fairly, reasonably, prudently, and honorably in the upholding of the contract and the providing value for the things that you have given them that they purchased. And in essence, they purchased them. And that's how I've always chosen to explain it. 
the minute that contract is signed, they have a purchase agreement. They are purchasing services, which includes takeaways, materials. When they get those materials, they're theirs because they're all personalized. Their names are all over it. It isn't a blank send of planners. They're all completely filled with their names and dates and everything. And there's work product. You see, time spent, work product, give them value. These things now become elements that buttress you've earned your money. So don't get caught up in the fetish and fantasy that some magic word, because guess what, folks? There's no magic beans to this. There's no magic beans. There's no pass, go, and collect $200 and get out of jail or whatever have you. It comes down to fair, balanced, reasonably, prudently. You have executed an agreement, and therefore they not only don't get their deposit back, they now owe you the balance because you have done everything you could to provide them, and you, you have incurred a loss of revenue because of their actions to breach the contract. The judge will decide for you, and you'll be awarded. No, you didn't perform, but you did everything you could to do that to mitigate their damage. The fact they didn't have you perform is not a service loss that's parceled out of some price, some piece. Rather, it's a function of they hired you to do something and they breached the contract and you did everything you could to replace the lost income. After you've done that, now your contract comes to bear. They owe you the money because you've done everything you could to mitigate their damage. And that's the key, folks. Being able to demonstrate that you're the good guy, that you did everything you could to mitigate damages, you did everything you could to uphold your side of the contract 100% completely. Oh, and by the way, if you have a exit strategy, a cancellation strategy in your, in your contract, uniformly enforce it. For example, if you let somebody out of your client for a hardship, that's going to hurt you. Because inevitably what will happen is when you stand before a judge, he's going to say, have you ever let anybody out of a contract before now and given them their money back? The minute you say yes, you're toast. You can make whatever ex excuses or reasons, but in the end, you're going to be in a hard way. Enforce your contract, but you know, and if you have a cancellation clause for them to cancel, execute it promptly and immediately. Don't waffle about it because what you want to look at if you ever have to go to court is that you have a consistent plan of enforcing your contract, executing it fairly, honestly, and reasonably. That's going to wrap it for this episode of Drax Bites. Put your questions and comments down below. In two weeks, join us on February 28th for Drax Bites Live and Unplugged. We're going to take your questions and answers. We're going to go over all of the things we've talked about in these first five or six episodes of Drax Bites. Get a more in-depth program for an hour. We're going to dig deep, and we're going to come back and cover things like your questions and take questions from you that, that night. And we'll hopefully get them all answered for you and help you build your business. Because remember, ADJA and the Photo Booth Association, we're here to help you to build and grow your business. That's the purpose of Drax Bites. My goal is to help you to have a great business. By giving you value, I hope you'll see the value in being a part of the organizations that we operate, ADJA and the Photo Booth Association, because there's even more value still in membership to those organizations. We're here to help you. So again, put your comments down below. You can reach me on Facebook at Hugo Drax. You can reach me online at Facebook at 4ADJA, office at ADJA, or you can go to our websites, thephotoboothassociation.com, adja.org, and reach out to us. And we're here to help you. Ladies and gentlemen, hope you've had a great night. Hope tonight was a great Valentine's Day. And hopefully you're watching this on the rewind and you went out and did something with that special person in your life. Have a great weekend. God bless.